Good morning, Axe family, and welcome to our virtual Sunday service. We're so grateful you've joined us to lift God's name today, and we thank you for the continued support. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube and to follow us on social media at Axe Santa Monica to stay up to date on all things happening. And if you would like to give to our church, you could do so by going online to axesantamonica.org and by clicking on the donating tab. And you can also give by mail and send it in a PO Box 7217 in Santa Monica, California. We look forward to receiving your gifts. Now today is communion, so don't forget to grab any elements you may need if you would like to participate with us. And this week's verse is Ephesians 6, 11, which says, put on all of God's armor. That way you can stand against the strategies of the devil. Friends, we're all going through the same types of battles and God tells us that we're strong on our own, but sometimes we need to go through them together. And community and family is so, so important to our journeys. And remember, here at Acts, we love you and we're here for you and want to pray for you. So send in any prayer requests through our social media pages or through our website. Now let's get our hearts ready for Pastor Joe's Word with some praise. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever you provide the fire I'll provide the sacrifice you provide the spirit
Well, today I want to talk a little bit about how we use the gift of language. You see, when God created the world, and He did, He also gave man some very special things. One of those is speech. Um, so I want to talk about that a little bit today. Uh, try to help us understand why the words we use when we say something is so important. So go with me to the book of Genesis. Let's go all the way back to creation, Genesis chapter 1. And I'm going to start at about verse 27. Here's the way it reads, 27 through 31. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, now that's key to the message, God said to them. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, ah, there we are again. Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. That's another important little phrase. And it was so. God said, and it was so. Meaning, God did what he said he would do. And verse 31 wraps it up. And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. So I want to use as a topic, God speaks. Because the connection here is that this is all about communication. How do we communicate with each other in light of how God has given us the gift of communication, the gift of words? In Genesis 1 and 3, uh, God begins speaking the world into existence, and he continues until all the world is created and everything that is in the world. We are blessed creatures given two things in particular that God has gifted us with. And they are simply this. We are, first of all, created in His image. And then God gives us instructions. Two very important things. If God is giving us instructions and He's created us in His image, then the things that He's given us, He wants us to use as if He's using them even our words, even and especially our words. This is finally about simple biblical steps of repentance and change because I think that we have to look at life that way. This is the amazing grace of our Lord that calls us back to God's purpose, grace and rescues and restores and forgives and delivers us. But he wants us to use our words. So first of all, what's God's plan for our words? Let's look at that as it unfolds before us. God speaks creation into existence. Now, it's not long after God speaks creation into existence that God creates man. And then it's not long that man takes what God has created and we distort it. We began to pretty quickly do things our way, the way we want to. But then it's not long and God seems to intervene and somehow puts his leadership in place of the world. And then we watch our leaders who began to sin, but yet seek forgiveness and repent of their sins. 
And not only that, but they pray that God will watch over them and, and just protect them from infringing upon what God has gifted them in a wrong way. King David is a perfect example. Here, let me share this with you uh, because David is writing this somatic expression in Psalms 141. Listen to these very brief words in verse 3. Because David realizes that some things can get out of control really quickly. So here's what David says in his prayer to Almighty God. He says, set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. In other words, what David is saying is that this thing can get out of control with how I use my words. But Lord, I want to use them in a way that it honors you. Shouldn't that be every Christian's prayer today? Can you imagine if everybody we know, and okay, especially ourselves, would pray that prayer every day? Dear Lord, set a watch, set a guard before the doors of my lips. We probably wouldn't say some hurtful things or wouldn't hear so many hurtful things. In Colossians, Paul writes in chapter 3 and verse 10, Put on a new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Paul is recalling to remembrance to the people in Colossae that God created them in his image. They should be using the things that God has created for God's benefit, not just theirs. And they should be careful and what they're doing with it, because everything we say creates this image of who we are. And we have been created in God's image. So we need to learn to speak that way. It was later in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 24, and I'll go on and use some other passages out of Ephesians, but here the Apostle Paul writes, You put on the new man, which was created according to God, in true righteousness and holiness. God is, is using Paul to advise the people of God that we need to be aware that God has created us in his image. And every day when we speak words, early in the morning, in the evening, in the middle of the day, at work, at play, with our families, these words that we speak, are to be spoken carefully. They are to be spoken in a way that it represents the image that we have been created in. We don't think of life that way. We just say what comes up, comes out. We just speak what we want to, regardless of who hears it or who doesn't hear it. We feel sometimes that our opinions expressed in words are more important than anything else. We have to get it out. Just say it, just speak it, regardless of how we speak it. No, that's not God's idea of the use of words. God's idea of the use of words is that we were created in his image. Therefore, we have to represent that image all the time. God's desire for our behavior in walk and in speech is that we act like the image that we're created in, in God's image. God chose to communicate with man through words. After all, I just pointed out something to you in that Genesis 1 and 28. He said, God said. God is speaking. And God blessed them. And God said to them. Yeah. See, the ability to communicate with words is one of the things that separates us from the rest of creation. Uh, when God created the animals and created the stars and the moon and, and, and threw, flung everything into existence, God gave man a special ability to speak with words. Yeah, we've used that ability in good ways, and we've also used it in ways that distorts the image of God in us. So what's God's plan of action for humanity? Most of us are painfully aware of the distance between where God wants us to be in using our words and where we really are. We are painfully aware of 
how that's working for us. God's desire for us is that we get to the heart of our communication struggles. God doesn't want you struggling over the use of words. He wants you to use those words, but use them wisely as he's designed for them to be used. Words are to be used to promote the image of God in us. You may say, uh, look, I don't struggle with my communication. I hear you. I hear you loud and clear. Because you think everything you say is right. And it doesn't matter how you say it. If folk would hear you the first time, you wouldn't have to be so rough with it the second time. I, we all have that built in us. That's the sin part that's trying to overcome the part that God has created us in his image. That's the war that's going on internally. And we're yielding sometimes. Now, do you want to know if you can identify yourself or not? Let me offer to you some well, eight different ways that you can identify if you're using your words to represent the image that God has created you in, or if you're not. Or you can say, well, it's not about me, it's about someone else. Okay, then you use these things, these eight things I'll tell you here very quickly. You use those things to assess for yourself how someone is communicating with you. Uh, let me give you some for instance. One, she hung up on me right in the middle of a sentence. Why? Why did she hang up on you in the middle of a sentence? You were doing the talking, but she hung up. There's a reason for that. What you were saying, were you saying it in the image of God? Or how were you saying it? What was the tonality that you were using? These are things that the scripture calls to our attention because what God wants is a certain behavior out of his people. Here's another for you. I'm not comfortable with the way she talks to me about other people. Do you say something about that? Or do you just go along with that? I wish our family could go through an entire day without someone yelling. Do you have that going on? She always, always has to have the last word. Do you really? Are you that important that you really must have the last word? We'll never get to the bottom of this if everyone keeps on talking at the same time. These are all ways that we distort the image of God that he's created us in by using our words. Here's another for you. He always talks so sweetly to me when we're in public. When we are in public is the key to it. How are you speaking to her when you're not in public, when you're in the private? God still hears. See, God hears everything all the time. And God is watching us. Are we living in the image that we've been created in? And our words are so cutting sometimes. I know you don't want to hear this, but I just have to say it. <laughs> Ever use that line? It's none of my business, but I just need to tell you anyways. There's another one. We can go on and on and on with this. The key here is that if God has created us in his image and if God said to us that the things he created are very good, then that calls his speech into question. So God has a plan. You know, uh, allow me to ask you, for instance, who among us have not been hurt by the words of another. Someone has always said something someplace down the line and you've been hurt by the words that they spoke. It could be the way they said it. Just could be the words themselves they used in saying it. They could have picked something different. Well, God is interested in how we communicate with each other. We do not have to use words the way we just want to use them. The reason we choose to use words negatively and harshly is because of the dominance of the influence of this sinful world 
that we live in. It's not because we've been trained to use words that way. We're not all actors on a, on a stage being told what to put an emphasis on and what not to put an emphasis on. We know what is right to say. We know the right way to say it. And by the way, we don't have to always use words. Sometimes silence is better than using words. It can be more convicting. But God has given us an opportunity. I go to Solomon, who the scripture says is the wisest man who ever lived. And Solomon says this in Ecclesiastes 7 and 29. He says, God made man upright but they have sought out many schemes. Man has decided to do what he wants to do when he wants to do it. He's decided to use his words the way he wants to use them. That's not God's plan for us. That's the opposite. It, it's, it's because we have made choices different than God has made for us that we use our words directly differently than God has intended that we use them. Jesus Christ is indeed our hope, and Jesus is the word the scripture says so in 1 John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. How does God want us to use human language that he gave man when he created man. First of all, it lets us know that this whole thing about God is that God plans our life for us. We take it off the rails. We do life the way we want to do it. We justify the things we say and do by ourselves, our standards. But if we dare stop for a moment and listen to what we say, how another person hears what we say. That's why in psychotherapy, the, the one that goes through that kind of training, they're told to always say, well, what did you hear me say? And they'll tell you that's a very important question to ask someone that didn't hear you correctly. Ask them, what did you hear me say? Because if they didn't hear you correctly, say it a different way. But for God's sake, say it so that you represent the image that you've been created in. If we stop, as David said, and ask the Lord to put a watch before the doors of our lips to, to control what we're saying is so important. That's why Paul said, I beat my flesh into existence every single day. Because it's a struggle. We all struggle with words. But God has a plan for us, and, and it's not that we use words the way we choose to use them. And he used apostle after apostle to come and preach to us about the use of words, to write letters in the scripture that go beyond the creation story in Genesis 1, to instruct us. That's why I said that God made us in his image. That's a huge benefit to humanity. And the second gift that we received is God gives us instructions. His instructions are in this word. And it is in this word that we should be burying ourselves every day. And it's hard to listen to ourselves talk. Maybe you should use your cell phone. Record yourself in a conversation sometime. Go back and play that conversation over again and see how many times you took aggressive action in the use of words that were negative in that conversation. These things are simple truths, but they're convicting truths. Peter had something to say about this in 1 Peter 4 and verse 11. He says, if anyone speaks, if anyone speaks, let him speak as an oracle of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be what? glorified through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. God deserves to get the glory out of what you say. God's intention is to get glory out of everything we do and say. We have to watch what we speak and how we speak. This is so important. This is, this is God's principle. There's no doubt about what 
Peter is saying in that writing. He says, if anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. Let him use the word of God to speak to humanity, to his fellow believer or non-believer. It's just as important how we speak to non-believers as to how we speak to believers. God is listening to everything we say all the time. Paul in Ephesians 4 and 25, he says, Therefore, putting away lying. Now, we know some folk that they just cannot tell the truth about anything. Everything coming out of their mouth has an untruth part to it. We all know people like that. You may be that person. I don't know. But here the apostle Paul is being very specific with the Ephesian believers. He's sending this letter to Ephesus to write to these believers in this church. And he says to them, therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. We're connected. Humanity is connected. Whether you are a believer or not, you are connected to humanity. God made all human beings in his image. Not some human beings, all human beings. We may not all live up to the image that God has created us in, but God has no respect of persons. He created all men in his image, every single one. Don't make me go down the list and list for you the categories of humanity today. But God has created all men in his image. We need to speak to human beings in a way that God gets glory because we are speaking to someone that's been created in the image of God. Every human being. That beggar on the street. Or we too could end up just like Davies, the rich man and the beggar. You remember the story, don't you? Well, you see, the rich man ignored the beggar. He threw scraps every once in a while to him under the table. But then the scripture says one, one day that both men died. Not on the same day, but the scripture says that Dives, the rich man, opened his eyes in Hades in hell, looked up into heaven and could see that, that Lazarus, that beggar, was in the bosom of Abraham. And so Dives, the rich man, pleaded with Lazarus. Or with, he pleaded with Abraham. He said, Abraham, Father Abraham, would you send Lazarus with a water on the tip of his finger to quench my thirst? All of a sudden, his words were coming out very nicely, but too late. Sometimes we speak too late. We change our minds on how we want to speak too late. That's why I said at the very beginning of this message that this message is not just about communication, but it's also about repentance. It's also about confession. Confess your sins before God and how you've spoken to someone. Could be your child that you spoke to wrong. Could be your adult parent that you spoke to wrong. Could be your neighbor. Could be the beggar on the street. We have to be careful how we speak to people. God is not just watching us. He's listening to us. He created us in his image and we are to give him glory. And he gives us clear instructions because look at this next statement that the Apostle Paul makes in Ephesians 4 and 29. This is a real calling out of some people of God. Paul says to them, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. But what is good for necessary edification, that, may, that it may impart grace to the hearers. Not grace to you, but grace to the ones that hear you. So that means mom and dad, when you're sitting in the front seat of the car and you get into a heated discussion, remember if your kids are in the back seat, you've got to, whatever you say in the front seat has to edify those in the back. It's got to build them up. It can't tear them down. It can't threaten their livelihood. It can't make them feel that, that something bad is going on. You've got to build them up. The word of God says so. Oh, if you did not know, this word in Ephesians 4 and 29 is in the imperative mood. It's an order. It's a command. 
that Paul has given to the people that he nurtured in the Lord in the church at Ephesus. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, except that it edifies. Only speak words that build up. That's what he means by edification. It must be building up. It must impart grace to the hearers. You know, when you walk into an environment in a store, in a public place, and someone is yelling and screaming at the clerk, because of some mistake they made or someone is yelling at the waiter in a restaurant because of some mistake they made or they didn't hear the order correctly. You have to ask yourself, put yourself in check. The scripture says here that don't let corrupt words proceed out of your mouth. That's in every circumstance. That's not just in some times. God is not saying that it's okay when you feel bad and you feel hurt or you feel unheard that you can attack this way. So what's our learning outcome? What do we get from this simple little message on the use of our words that God has created us in his image and expects of us? The value of every piece of human communication is rooted in the fact that God speaks. God spoke the world into existence. Genesis 1. He spoke to us. He said to us, this is the way to live. He's giving us instruction throughout the scriptures. Finally, God proclaims that everything, including human language, that he created was good. In Genesis 1 and 31. Then God saw everything that he had made, it says, and indeed it was very good. And what does God expect of us? So the evening and the morning and the sixth day comes, he says. If God saw human language as good and if he modeled good use of it for us, shouldn't we also model a good use of the human language? Especially as we are in relationship with others. Genesis 1 emphasizes the awesome power of our creator and yet reminds us that human beings are the clear focus of God's loving concern. If God wasn't concerned about you, he would not have given you the ability to speak with words. God is concerned about you. God wants you to use your words for the building up of others. You know what that does? That calls people to who God is because you are presenting the image of God to humanity, especially when you know they're wrong and you're right. You don't have to yell that out. You don't have to disparage them. Just speak the words that God has given you to speak as you represent the image of the creator, not just of your words, but the creator of your being. And don't forget, God has also created the other human being that you're talking to in his image. So when you speak to someone, think about that. Let me address them in the image that they were created in. That makes a difference, friends. So if you want to follow this kind of thinking and this kind of behavior, you want to improve the behavior in your life, if you don't know the Lord, let me invite you to come to know him. The scripture says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ died on the cross for you, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. You shall be saved. You will be brought into relationship with him. And if you already know the Lord, let me employ you to please start confessing and repenting of the use of your words. Go back to someone that you have said something harsh and way out of line with. It could be an employee of yours. It could be a sibling of yours. It could be your parent, your neighbor. Go back to them and confess that you use those words not considering the image that God had created them in. You use those words as if God didn't create them. Confess that, own that. It'll make you a better person and you will be acting as God has created you in his own image. God loves you, friends. Use your words for the edification of others, for the building up of someone. This week, make a concerted effort 
to just do that. Say something good to someone that you know you would say something bad to. And say it in a good kind of way. Say it in a way that you're seeing them as being created in the image of God. Today we also have our communion day. And this is a great day for communion. When we look at God's retribution, this divine retribution that will come upon the sinners of this world. And he used the example of brothers, blood brothers, twin brothers, warring against each other. That's our warning. We pick fights with everybody, especially within our family. This is the time to not only go before Almighty God and tell Him your regrets about the fights that you've started that have not been appropriate, and seek His forgiveness. Go back to those individuals in your family that you've hurt and you've wronged, and tell them that the Lord has moved on your heart to change that behavior. Repent of it. Don't put yourself in a category of waiting for retribution from God. Don't put yourself in a place where the things you've done wrong will come back to you. Put yourself in a place where the grace of God is seriously better than anything else, seeking His mercy upon yourself. And so what did He do? Jesus Christ Himself on that evening as He gathered with His disciples together in the upper room, He said to them that He was going to take bread and break that bread. And He did that. And He told them that the bread that He would take would represent his body. And it's upon the cross of Calvary that he died for us. He died for all humanity, for the sins of all mankind. So we come to that place and he said to us that he would take the cup, the fruit of the vine, and he did so. And he blessed it. And he said, let's drink this. He says, I'll never drink it again with anyone until I go to my father's house and return to my people. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, would you bless this bread that represents your body that hung on Calvary's cross and was torn there for my sins, for the sins of all humanity, for the guilt that goes along with sin. You erase the guilt by hanging on the cross, giving up your own life so that I could be saved. Lord, would you bless this today? And then, Father, would you bless the cup, the fruit of the vine, that represents your blood. For without the shedding of blood, you said, there would be no remission of sins. So, Father, I want my sins forgiven. So as we do this today, we do it in remembrance of what you have done for us to make us just right with Almighty God. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Shall we eat together? Shall we take the cup and let's drink? God bless you, friend.